Hello boys and girls. Today we're gonna talk about a family-friendly version of cynicism. It is called stoicism. It gives you a peace of mind and unlocks endless possibilities for shaming people. There's a famous quote from a Roman poet, Juvenal that the Stoics differ from the Cynics only by a tunic. It is a very good, very brutal and very deep joke, if you know what he's talking about. Cynics uh, were wearing a very simple clothing, usually ignoring the undershirt, so to speak, a Hiton Greek version or a tunic Roman version. They just wrapped themselves in a cloak or a hematium. And Stoics were less ascetic and more civilized. Uh, they could easily wear two layers of clothing. And that's the primary difference between the doctrines of cynicism and Stoicism. Both uh, agreed that everybody should live in uh, accordance with nature. No, tree hugging. Nature means uh, physis, uh, the natural law, if you will. Uh, but Stoicism always insisted that uh, it implies culture and, yes, uh, civilization. Uh, cynics mostly ignored it. Uh, they didn't care about unnatural human communities, building cities, creating families, and things like that. For a Stoic, it is normal if a dog lives in accordance with its nature. But a human being shouldn't live in accordance with the nature of a dog or a horse, or a swine. A human being should live in accordance with the nature of a human. So yeah, wearing more than one layer of clothes is normal for a stoic. For a cynic, uh, it is probably a bit too much. What is stoicism in a nutshell? It is relatively easy to make a short video on Epicureanism or Cynicism. Uh, please check them out, by the way. I mean, when you don't have many original sources, mostly just anecdotes here and there, uh, you can force yourself to condense stuff quite effectively. Uh, but the more sources you have, well, you try to include this and that and then turn everything into a 20-hour cycle of discussions. You always feel that you're just scratching the surface. Because indeed you are. You cannot make a 20-minute video on stoicism and then say that, uh, yeah, that's all you need to know. So please treat this particular video as a short introduction to stoicism, not a comprehensive guide. And, uh, as always, this is the moment uh, when we must talk about the original sources. While we have serious problems with uh, Epicureanism and Cynicism, the situation with Stoicism is much better. It's not optimal, it's not even good. As you probably know, something like 95% of the ancient works of literature, philosophy and history, well, it's all lost, it's gone. So, no, the situation is bad, uh, but a serious body of work on Stoicism is uh, still with us. Stoicism is usually divided into three periods, early, middle, and late, or Roman Stoicism. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit later. The thing is, uh, none of the complete works from the early period survived. There are bits and pieces, a reasonable amount. Most of them, or probably even all of them, are collected in fragments of the early Stoics by Hans von Arnim. Uh, the middle period is gone as well, but there are some bits and pieces as well, and some of the later authors quote the Stoics of this period. For example, certain philosophical works of Cicero are entirely based on uh, Panicius and uh, Posidonius, uh, the two main figures of the middle Stoa. And then we have uh, the late period, uh, the Roman period. And fortunately, certain texts from this period somehow were preserved in its entirety. Uh, this is the period of Seneca, 
a significant body of work is with us, including his magnum opus, Moral Letters to Lucilius. This is the period of Epictetus, and we have his diatribes or discourses. Uh, well, it was recorded or maybe even written by Arian, his student, but that's a separate question. Uh, this is also the period of Marcus Aurelius, and we have bits and pieces of uh, Gaius Musonius Rufus, uh, mostly in Stabius and his anthology. Uh, we have a Dio Chrysostom, but he's not considered a stoic, really. Now, this is far from being optimal, especially if you know that Chrysippus wrote something like 700 works and we have zero. It's all gone. And he was considered one of the most important Greek philosophers. Or if you know that there are lots of works of Posidonius on practically every topic imaginable, and he was incredibly, astonishingly influential. Some researchers even say that he practically helped to shape Neoplatonism. None of his works survived, and it is a cultural catastrophe. But at the same time, the situation is much better than it could be compared to, say, Epicureanism. Uh, the amount of information is huge. Okay, now we are done with the sources and we can finally move to the main part. The founder of Stoicism was Zeno of Citium. Citium, or Citeon, uh, was a city on Cyprus, on the site of the present-day city of Larnaca. Uh, there are some interesting and occasionally very questionable anecdotes about Zeno in uh, Diogenes Laertius, but the Bottom line is, uh, Zeno arrived in Athens and became a student of Crates, a prominent cynic philosopher. Uh, please watch the video on cynicism. The link is in the corner of this screen. Uh, Crates was a student of Diogenes, who was a student of Antisthenes, who was a student of Socrates. So the Stoics took a lot of pride in tracing their lineage up to Socrates himself. Zeno later left Crates and founded his own school that effectively was a more civilized offshoot of cynicism. He gathered uh, with his students at the Painted Porch in Athens, and the Painted Porch is uh, Pekilea Stoa in Greek. Uh, that's how Stoicism got its name. Zeno laid out the foundation of Stoicism, but his teachings were properly developed and systematized by the third head of the school. Chrysippus, uh, who is considered the second founder of Stoicism. Uh, the school existed for hundreds of years after that, but the core of the philosophy was formed during this period, and although later Stoics obviously had their own ideas and interpretations, uh, the main principles remained largely intact uh, since the time of Chrysippus. First of all, Zeno divided the teachings of the school into three parts, logic, physics, and ethics. And yeah, if you're pedantic, then Cleanthes, uh, the second head of the school, divided into six parts. Uh, but it was uh, more of the same, and later the school operated with the original division anyway. Logic deals uh, with the criteria of uh, what is true and what is false. So basically, uh, with what we call logic. And also with the rhetorics, structure of knowledge, epistemology, uh, dialectics, and all the things necessary to explain and understand things properly, and not just resort to pure empiricism. Uh, physics uh, deals with, well, physics or metaphysics. Uh, what is the universe and how it works? And both logic and physics basically worked for the crown jewel of the Stoic philosophy, ethics. And one of the main features of the Stoic ethics was, and still is, its a practical appliance. It is not only a theoretical discipline. So logic and physics are mostly gone. Physics can be reconstructed, there is enough information for that, and we will talk about it in a moment. Stoic logic is largely lost, only certain parts remain. Especially if we're talking not about logic as a part of this triad, logic, physics, ethics, but about, you know, proper logic, formal logic. It was 
properly developed, mostly by Chrysippus, uh, it was obviously heavily influenced by Aristotelian logic and overall quite comparable, but it had certain distinct features. We must say a number of things about Stoic physics, or metaphysics if it sounds better for you, because it explains some of the aspects of ethics and all this let's live according to nature stuff. Like any Greek philosophy of this period, the Stoic school tried to explain the world. Later on, and definitely right now, uh, physics could be interpreted as a more or less a poetic metaphor. Uh, some of the ideas are quite dated from the modern perspective. Uh, come on, Cleanthes, the second head of the school, once wrote an essay against uh, Aristarchus of Samos, debunking his outrageous theories. And Aristarchus was the first person we know of uh, who presented the heliocentric model. For Cleanthes and for Chrysippus, and most probably even for Posidonius, uh, the Earth was in the center of the universe. Uh, the Sun was moving around the Earth, and the planets of the solar system were considered stars. Uh, if they knew how wrong they were, uh, then the ethics of Stoicism uh, would have been, uh, my guess is, uh, absolutely the same. Anyway, uh, the universe, uh, the cosmos, includes everything. Uh, it's intelligent, it is material, although there are certain incorporeal things, like time. And the universe is the god. The universe is this nature we were talking about earlier. Uh, living according to nature is living according to the natural laws of the universe. The universe can also be represented as Logos and uh, as the artisan fire, Ignis Artificialis. Uh, the universe has a soul. Uh, this soul is a combination of fire and air. It is called Pneuma, uh, sometimes pronounced in English as Numa. But there is a P in the beginning of the word in Greek. Uh, pneuma is translated into Latin as spiritus. So this is literally the spirit of the cosmos. And the spirit unifies the universe and keeps it together through tension, tonos. The universe, as we said, is intelligent and there is causality, there is cause and effect. And it is a very complex system. Everything moves the way it should. Uh, you just don't know where and why, unless you are, in fact, a Laplace's demon. Raise your hand if you are. Which leads us to determinism, or fate. So, the universe is rational, and it makes sense. That's good news. The universe is in the eternal cycle of deaths and rebirths. Uh, when the time is right, uh, the universe is consumed in fire, the conflagration, ekpirosis, and then it gets uh, restored to the original state and the cycle begins again. And this cycle is identical to the previous one because essentially this is the best of the possible worlds and uh, uh, that's just how stuff works. In Watermelon Sugar, the deeds were done and done again as my life is done in Watermelon Sugar. I'll tell you about it because I'm here and you're distant. Well, not all of the Stoic philosophers agreed with the idea of ekpirosis, uh, most notably Panicius. Uh, he was more into Platonism. Although not into the world of forms, uh, Stoics always were nominalists. That was the simplified version of physics. Contrary to popular belief, Stoic physics probably could be really complicated, uh, on par with the metaphysical concepts of Plato and uh, Aristotle. Although, just like logic, it was pretty much a subordinate of ethics. And during the Roman period of Stoicism, ethics basically eclipsed everything. Now, ethics, which is linked to logic and physics. Okay, we have nature, we have fate, and we have virtue. And virtue is living according to nature. If you're doing this, then you have happiness. So, how do we know what is according to nature? 
and how can we actually do something if everything is predetermined? Well, we are sentient beings, so we can use logic and our amazing powers of observation. Uh, we can figure out what is good according to nature and what is bad not according to nature. And we can make our own decisions because we are quite autonomous. Stoic philosophy is not only a deterministic philosophy, it also ventures into compatibilism, which means that the world is determined, but our will is free. Uh, there are things that are not under our control. Most of the things are not. But our mind, our perception of things, our ability to make a judgment and make an educated virtuous decision, uh, that's under our control. Chrysippus explains compatibilism at a great length in his works. He basically spent a lifetime thinking about free will and determinism. And you can read all of his works, all 700 of them, uh, if you have a time machine. You can actually go to the future because the next cycle will be identical to... Okay, now how do we make decisions? This is where it also may become really complex and I'm not sure I've got a cerebral capacity for that. So let's keep it simple. Uh, there's virtue and there's vice. Uh, there's no in between. Vice or evil comes only from your decisions. And there are things that are indifferent or adiaphora. Uh, that's not in between. It's literally indifferent things that are neither good nor bad in itself. All depends on your moral choice. The hammer is neither good nor bad. It is an instrument. You can use it for good purposes, or you can use it for bad. Uh, when you're doing something, you use your judgment, preferably. You have an impulse to do something, and your choice is either to approve it or to reject it. Animals and little children react on impressions and impulses instinctively and automatically, but a grown-up human is fully sentient, supposedly, and can use his or her reason, a correct judgment on what is good and what is bad, because bad decisions uh, come only if a person has false opinions about good and evil. Uh, let me give you a basic example of how it all works in combination with determinism. I'll give you a quote. A funny quote. It is better to be healthy and rich than poor and sick. A Stoic would argue that no, it's not better. Your wealth and your health are not entirely in your control. Most of the time they are not in your control at all. And most of the time there is no moral choice involved. And when the moral choice is involved, sometimes it can be that ending up poor and sick is actually better given the circumstances, morally better, and that's what counts. One can argue, and many Stoics actually did, uh, that wealth uh, can corrupt you, uh, but it hasn't corrupted Marcus Aurelius. So money is not a problem per se. Your judgment is a possible problem. So if we don't know the circumstances and the possible moral choices, if we have only this phrase, this statement without any context, uh, it's not better and it's not worse. It's neither inherently good nor bad. It's indifferent. It all depends on moral choices. But since we are not idiots fighting with reality, it can be said that when there is no moral context, it is preferable to be healthy and rich. Kind of like this. Okay, now, next thing. Reason shouldn't be corrupted by passions. Now, what are these passions exactly? Stoics want to achieve apathia, absence of passions. It is often misunderstood. The Greek word apathia is not the same as modern apathy. It is hard to translate it properly even into Latin. That's why Seneca uses a phrase tranquillitas animi, uh, tranquility of the soul, which is probably closer to ataraxia, but uh, that's a different subject. Uh, there are four main passions. 
fear, sorrow, can be translated as distress. Immoderate appetite can be translated as lust. And pleasure can be translated as delight. All of them have uh, subdivisions. Uh, you should control your passions, otherwise uh, they might control you in your actions, uh, which makes you a slave. So we're talking about control here, not about apathy, and not about feeling nothing and being a robot. There are actually good passions, so to speak. Technically, not passions, but more like rational emotions. And they directly correspond to bad passions, being their opposites. So the opposite of fear would be caution, a reasonable aim to escape future evils. Uh, there's no opposite of sorrow or distress, uh, because uh, there is no evil in the present moment for a wise man. The opposite of immoderate appetite or lust is a wish or a will guided by the reason, a will for virtue based on the correct judgment. It is literally translated into Latin as uh, voluntas, will. And the opposite of pleasure, which is the false judgment of what is good, is the correct judgment, joy. Obviously, all three good rational emotions, just like the four irrational passions, uh, have subdivisions. Uh, we're talking about the main categories. Uh, the subdivisions actually kind of explain what is this particular category exactly. So basically, that's what forms the core of the Stoic teachings. And uh, as I said before, the majority of all of this was established during the period of early Stoa. Of course, Stoics didn't know what is early or middle Stoa. It's a modern division. And some even argue that it makes sense to have two subdivisions instead of three and bundle uh, middle and late Stoa together. Let's talk a little bit about these divisions and what happened to the school and the philosophy after Chrysippus. A couple of generations after Chrysippus, the new head of the school, Panicius, started spreading the philosophy to Rome. Uh, he wasn't the first head of the school to go to Rome, it was probably Diogenes of Babylon, his teacher. But Panicius managed to make Stoic ideas popular among Roman aristocracy, and Panicius became friends with Scipio Emilianus. In time, it all helped Stoicism to become a truly international philosophy. Uh, some of the researchers preferred to call Panicius the founder of Roman Stoicism. Panicius modified some of the aspects of the teachings, adding more features of Platonism, uh, to a point that some of the modern scholars actually referenced uh, his version of the philosophy as uh, Stoic Platonism, which is very debatable. Panicius prominently rejected the idea of cosmic uh, conflagration and probably made certain improvements to the idea of apatheia and the concept of passions. He was succeeded by his pupil, Posidonius, and Posidonius was a person who not only visited Rome and spent some time there, but he eventually left Athens, uh, for reasons of which we have no information, and founded his own school on the island of Rhodes. Uh, this school became very influential and very popular, especially among Romans. Posidonius was visited by Cicero and apparently was friends with uh, Pompey Magnus. Posidonius is sometimes called the Stoic Aristotle. Uh, he was uh, interested in everything, and apart from being a Stoic philosopher, he was also an accomplished astronomer, mathematician, biologist, ethnographist, geographer, historian, everything. He wrote a lot of books and quite probably was only second to Chrysippus in terms of the quantity of the written material. And unlike Chrysippus, he paid attention to the style of his works, so they were readable. None of his works survived, but it is believed that Posidonius was probably the biggest philosopher of his time. After Posidonius begins the period that is usually called Late Stoa or Roman Stoicism, and this is actually a moment when the teachings of the school, Stoa, 
are no longer limited to the school. Uh, their ideas are so widespread in the Roman world that it's possible to talk about a proper stoicism, not only the school. It is hard to say when middle store became late store, but I would probably argue that the defining moment was the suicide of Cato the Younger. This is when the cult of martyrdom entered stoicism and made it a bit tragic, a bit pessimistic, and even more focused on practical ethics. This is the period from which we have complete works and it deserves special and very careful attention, uh, which is not within the scope of this particular video. I'm desperately trying to keep things short and simple. And uh, I fail. Roman Stoicism is dominated by the Roman philosophers. Seneca even wrote in Latin. Epictetus was technically a Greek, but he spent his formative years in Rome. His teacher, Musonius Rufus, was a Roman equestrian. And obviously uh, there's Marcus Aurelius and his diary or the exercises on self-programming. And Marcus Aurelius was the emperor of Rome. Roman Stoicism gets more and more religious overtones, especially in the works of Epictetus. I've heard that some of the modern professors actually call Stoicism not a philosophy, but a religion. But well, you can call any school of philosophy a religion then. Uh, you can start with Plato. Why not? Stoicism disappeared together with the other two philosophical schools we were talking about, Epicureanism and Cynicism but left a lasting impact and parts of Stoicism were in fact borrowed by the Christianity, along with the pieces of Plato and especially Aristotle. Uh, there were attempts to revive Stoicism, the latest in the 20th century, uh, which leads us to what is usually called modern Stoicism. So Stoicism is actually pretty much alive these days. That's it, in a nutshell. If you have something to say, I strongly encourage you to leave a comment. Also, don't forget to subscribe, share, like, you know. So, thanks for watching, and see you soon.